Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin today's study, and as we come together to puzzle out what the Lord is presenting before us, shall we seek his wisdom and his blessing as we enter into worship with him today? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we follow the words of Father Miller and the admonition of Sister White, as we bring all the verses regarding 10,000 together, we seek your guidance, we seek your direction. We ask, Father, for your wisdom that we may come to understand this properly. To understand what these passages mean for us today, so that we may correctly address the examples and the figures that we are seeing. I thank you, Father, for each one that is attending this meeting this morning, and for those that will participate later in watching this by video. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We praise you for your patience. Help us now and guide us. Be with us as we accept that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you will be also. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Okay. Yesterday we left off with the question regarding First Chronicles twenty nine seven. Now, as we were addressing this, we were pointing out that the verse reads, "And gave for the service of the house of God of gold five thousand talents and ten thousand." drams, and of silver 10,000 talents, and of brass 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron. Now, of course, all four of these are what we would see in the figures in Daniel chapter 2, especially in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But what do these weights mean for us? As we've studied previously, cubits can mean a couple of different things because there is a, a royal cubit and there's a standard cubit. Is there a talent of the sanctuary and a standard talent or is there just one talent alone? Well, as far as I know, there's just one talent. Okay. Now, I've, I've sort of neglected some of my study on weights and measures um, that I had started on because I was doing a lot of research. Now, there's um, a scientist who has, well, it's actually a group of scientists. They were doing some research, and they came to understand the astronomical basis for um, the, these measurements. Okay. But they're based on the, the circumference of the earth, um, which is ah. interesting. Angela, you had something to say? Oh, I was just very surprised when you said that. That's a totally new concept to me. Sorry, I didn't know my mic is on. I'll mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And um, so... So there's, and, and I spent a lot of time looking at this before, and I, so I can't remember all the details, but um, uh, this is more related to the idea of a meter as the basis for uh, the volume, and then the weights come from these volumes. So, but I don't think there is a separate uh, talent, per se, of the sanctuary. Okay. 
that I know of, but I could be wrong. But yeah, so you have these different things. You have gold, silver, brass, and iron. Um, all these things uh, that are being given here for the sanctuary. Um, so I, I don't, don't know if this helps us in our study of the symbolism of 10,000. But we do have 10,000 talents of silver here mentioned. And... Um, And we know that the number that, that silver, the gematria for the English silver is 77. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's intriguing for me because we're being told of 5,000 talents, which is, of course, half of 10,000. But to that is added 10,000 drams. Okay. So we have this weight of gold. Half of the weight of the gold plus 10,000 drams. And then we follow that with 10,000 talents of silver. Yeah. Now, to just correct myself here. So gold, so I'm using um, Iran's... Uh, Gematria calculator. So the reverse sum of gold is 70. The reverse sum of silver is 77. Okay. Um, the reverse sum of brass is 76. And the reverse sum of iron is 52. Uh, the forward sums are different, but... Uh, now, when you're what saying what are reverse, sorry, what are reverse sums? I have no idea what you're talking about. So when when you use gematria, A is one, B is two, C is three. A reverse sum, Z is one, Y is. Oh. Two. Okay. Yeah. All right, got it. Thanks. Yeah. So his calculator does normal sum, reverse sum, normal product, reverse product. So, so for instance, if you do something like uh, Lamech, the, the normal uh, sum is 42. The normal product is 18,720. And the reverse sum is 120. And then the reverse product is a huge number, uh, 54,774,720. So um, so we just have these four different ways in which we look at uh, a name in English or a word. Where would you find his calculator at on the web? So you go to uh, palmanai.org, and you'll see his different calculators and charts and different things are all there. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, that's uh, dealing with those those symbols. So they, they they're pretty interesting. We got uh, 70, 77, 76, and fifty two for the reverse sums. Okay. <clears throat> So as we look at those reverse sums, you're saying <clears throat> 70 for gold, 77 for silver, right? Yeah. 76 for brass, for brass. and 52 for iron. Yeah. So additively that would be 275. okay but <clears throat> when we're looking at this we have two groups of 10,000 that are mm -hmm. mentioned in this particular verse we have 10,000 drams of gold 
and we have 10,000 talents of silver. Why would this be important for us to, to note? I mean, I'm understanding that a talent is 60 mina. Is that correct? Um, yeah, so there's two different ways in which this can be divided. Um, okay. So let me see here. So I have a paper on this that I was working on. It's not quite as simple as that. Okay. Uh, so I get it. So what is a, a pound of gold? Is that 16 ounces? Is it 14 ounces? What, how do we view this? I don't know. Do we go according to troy ounces? I mean. Yeah, okay, so you got the chart here. So yeah, so there is, um, yeah. right. So the idea is there's 5,000 talents or, or 5,000, how's this work? I don't remember now. So, so you got this chart here of Dividing the talent. Yeah. I don't know if this is correct or not. Yeah, so there's 300 shekels to a talent. Okay. Right, so, but sometimes, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the difference is sometimes there's, 50 talents to, uh, or 50 minas to a talent. Let me see, I'm trying to remember this. I can't remember how that works. My, my mind's blank right now when it comes to this. All, all I know is that there is, um, yeah, sometimes there's 60 shekels to Amina. Sometimes there's 50 shekels to Amina. Um, but there's always 300 minas to a talent, or, or 300 shekels to a talent. Does that make sense? I think that's correct. So you, you're just going to have to keep going because I, I, I'm empty right now. I can't remember how that works. Well, the reason I'm asking the question the way that I am, a standard mm -hmm. ounce would weigh out at 28.35 grams. A troy ounce, that which is used for precious metal, would, be, would weigh out at 31.1 grams. Yeah. All I know is that there is a huge disagreement regarding these ancient measures. Okay. So, so there isn't like some specific number that people are agreed upon and how to interpret these ancient measures. So when it comes to putting them into our measurements, to a large degree, it, there's such a large margin of error, margin of error. Um, it's a slippery slope there. Um, so, so, you know, you can't really do the conversion, I don't think, at this point, until I sort this out. Because you're just going to have all these different measurements. That was the problem that I ran into with weights and measures. I, I didn't have something that I could say, I know that this is how much it weighs. 
right? So you'll have different people telling you different things. So if we're going to use them as symbols, uh, I think we have to stick to the actual uh, measurements that are given us in the Bible. We can't really convert them at this point. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So that, that and that's a major problem, right? I mean, because we can take things like calendars and we can convert them, you know, and we know that we're accurate. But when it comes to uh, these types of weights, we, we don't know. At least I, I think we do know, but I don't know enough to sort between the correct and the false. Well, I, I'm going to point out something just just because I'm curious. Okay. Here we have <clears throat> a weight for a shekel showing as 11.3 grams. Mm -hmm. But a troy ounce is exactly the opposite. 31.1 gram. Okay. Now, you were saying that Amina if if we were multiplying this for to look for a talent that there was approximately 300 minas <clears throat> in one talent okay so there is okay here's how it goes there is uh 60 mana in a talent or 50 mana in a talent there's two different ways it can be done. Okay. Uh, there's always 3,000 shekels in the talent. Okay. And there's and there's always uh, six th 60,000 giras in the talent. The thing is the, the mana, uh, the talent can be divided either 60 mana and 50 she of 50 shekels or 50 mana of 60 shekels. Right. So there's two different ways it can be done. So that's one problem, but we don't really know how much a talent weighs. At least it's it's not. There isn't an, a, a universal agreement on that. OK, but you said there's always how many shekels to a talent? Three thousand. <clears throat> OK. So if there's always. 3,000, if there's 60 mana, mana, that would mean that that would have to be 50 shekels because then you would have 50 times 60 to get your 3,000, right? Right. So it's just, it, yeah. So it's just um, how we're dividing the mina uh, or you know, so whether we have a mina of 50 shekels or 60 shekels. So the mina can vary then. The talent doesn't vary and the shekel doesn't vary. All right. So, so where did you, um, So where did you get the measurements of into metric, for instance, and pounds? That was part of a chart that I'd found online. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm here on a, uh, a talent converter. And you want it, you want to do gold, right? And we can do it into, well, this is going to give you two tons, 60 talents is two tons, they say here. Okay. Which is a lot more than 35 kilograms.
Okay. Just a moment. So I don't know. So you were doing, or you're just doing one pound, uh, dividing the talent. You're doing one pound. I'm not sure how we're doing this. Okay. What I was doing, I was looking at this to say if we have 50 talent or 5,000 talents of gold. Okay. So 5,000 talents. I then took it if this was to a standard ounce. I was looking at it to say. Okay, so these people are using one talent is 34 kilograms. Okay. I'm not sure how their calc their converters are operating. Well, <clears throat> I just posted the website that's that's here under under the little chart that says dividing the talent. Okay. Yeah, so right now, uh, so I really need to, to sort this stuff out myself because um, this paper written by the scientist is pretty convincing. And it was a group of scientists that, that did this research. So they weren't really interested in um, like proving anything. They were just um, doing some measurements. And so they found that, that this was based upon the circumference of the earth from north to south. So not from, not along the equator, but uh, basically the longitudinal, is that the longitude, yeah, longitudinal measurement of the earth's circumference, which they found pretty fascinating that they could take these measurements and match them. But I still have to do research on it. So um, yeah, and, and it makes quite a bit difference if it's 34 kilograms or 35 kilograms for a talent. I mean, your numbers are gonna come out way differently. Exactly. Yeah. Because then the interrelation between the kilos and the, and the pounds would also be different. Yeah. So we would wind up with a difference in the ounces. We would all also have a, a difference in the drams. Mm -hmm. So, so I haven't sorted this out, and 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 the I, I don't understand it. it. It you know why people come up with these different measurements, what they're based upon. So, so I really can't speak with any kind of authority on this at this point. I don't I don't know enough. Okay, so do we leave this off and try to continue through the study? What, what would yeah, that's what I would do. I wouldn't try to figure this out at this point. That's what I'm trying to say, yeah. We, we just don't, we're just guessing there, and I don't like guessing. Okay. Well, we are able to establish that First Chronicles 29.7, is our first representation of the third word being translated as 10,000. Mm -hmm. So if we are looking at this, what we wind up with is we have a, a representation for the 10,000 drams, which is ribo. Yeah, and it's sort of based on the other word though. I understand that part of it. Yeah. But when we look at the silver, we, we wind up with asara 
LF being our 10,000 talents. So why are two different words, why are two different phrases being used in the same verse for this portion that's translated into English as 10,000? I mean, in all the other verses, it's either we're seeing one word or we're seeing another. Or we're seeing one phrase or we're seeing another. Why is this one giving us two different phrases? In the book of Daniel, What's translated evening and morning, Arab and Boker, is translated one way in the English, but when, if we get into the German, if we get into the Spanish, if we get into other, other languages, we see it as being evening and morning. What is it about this that made the translators choose the same English phrase? from two disparate phrases. Are they trying to tell us something? Is God leading us to, to understand something here? And this is why I was asking the questions regarding the weights. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to return to this portion. Now, 2 Chronicles 25, 11. And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote the children of Seir 10,000. So Amaziah went to destroy 10,000 of the children of Seir. Would those not be Edomites? In the following verse, and other 10,000 left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them unto the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock that they were all broken in pieces. Does that mean that there's a total of 20,000 of the children of Seir that were at this conflict with Amaziah? How would we see this? Well, it must be. So they killed 10,000 and, and then 10,000 alive, they uh, carried away captive brought them to the top of the rock, cast them down from the top of the rock that they were all broken in pieces. Hmm. Yeah, so this is probably, I mean, this is an Indo, Indo, Indumia, Indumia, how do you say that? Indumia. Um, yeah, so this is, this is like in the area of Petra. Okay. Which could be what's being referred to here um, is that area. Well, here again. <clears throat> um, just at one point here, the, um, the translators also reference us to Ezekiel 25, 12. Okay. Um, which is kind of interesting because it's Second Chronicles 25, 12. Okay. And and that verse says, Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and hath greatly offended and have revenged himself upon them. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. So, so it's the prophecy against Edom is in Ezekiel 25, 12. So, I mean, obviously there's other verses dealing with the Edomites, but it's here with this verse with the 10,000 that are alive that they throw from the top of the rock. So they do battle with a total of 20,000, 10,000 10, of which are killed in the battle, 10,000 are taken alive and thrown off from the top of the rock or, or crag or peak or, or however we want to look at this. Yeah, and it's also, of course, 2512, right? So that's December 25th. Right. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if there is some significance there. So would we look at this, since both of these verses are being referenced with 10,000, that we have a sequential situation on November 25th, we would have a battle and December 25th, that there would be those that would be thrown off of the rock, thrown off of a crag. I don't know. I have no idea. All I'm saying is just noticing these these uh, coincidences of of numbers. Okay. I don't know if I would take the November 25th. I would just say because we have these two verses, the prophecy against Edom in Ezekiel, right. which we've gone through, it starts on 2512, and we're in Second Chronicles 2512, and we already know the significance of that date. And, and we know that Ezekiel addresses uh, the captivity of Jehoiachin, who's re released in, on 2512, on the 25th day of the 12th month from prison. Um, that there must be some symbolism there. But I don't know if I can put it all together at this point. Okay. Then we go to Second Chronicles 27.5. He fought also with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. And the children of Ammon gave him the same year an hundred talents of silver and 10,000 measures of wheat and 10,000 of barley. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him both the second year and the third. So here... 100,000 talents of silver, 10 times 10,000 talents are being received, but yet 10,000 measures of wheat and 10,000 measures of barley are also received. And these are paid three years in a row. Right. So we would see a total in that three-year period of 300,000 talents of silver and 30,000 measures of wheat and 30,000 of barley. Mm -hmm. What could the wheat and the barley represent? Well, when it comes to the wheat and barley, you have um, them mentioned together um, in... Uh, So the first mention is Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, that you have wheat and barley mentioned together. Okay. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and land of olive oil and honey. Um, and then in Ruth 2.23, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of, the bar of barley harvest and of wheat harvest. Um, 
And so there's lots of verses where barley and wheat are mentioned together. But the one I was thinking of was Revelation 6.6. 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And, and that, of course, is in the messages of the seals. That's the third seal. Um, and, the, and the penny is a denarii, a denarius or whatever it is. Right. But was that also not a day's wages? Um... Well, I think I think so. Be a day's wages. So we're when we're speaking of a measure of wheat, what are we actually speaking about? I don't know, a bushel. Um, That'd be quite a bit. I don't know. I'm not sure what a measure is. Uh, okay. They say uh, here it says they don't know what it was. About um, as much as a person could eat in a day. Well, a bush would be quite a bit. Yeah, so it wouldn't be a bush. Huh? So I guess it would be a measurement. It, it refers to a measurement of what is sufficient for a man for one day. Okay. And yeah, the Greek word is konik, konix. Uh, something like that. Konix. Well, it's interesting because when we're talking about 10,000 measures, then that is 10,000 portions. Either, either we're dealing with enough wheat to feed 10,000 men for a day or one man for 10,000 days. Yeah, well, this measurement here is a core, which I, I believe is a larger measure than it would be uh, the same as the, the Omer. So in other words, it's reference. That'd be, that'd be five gallons or five bushels and five gallons. So that would be quite a lot more. So this is a lot larger measurement. So this isn't the same measure. It's a different, different type of measure. So 10,000 quorum of wheat. Yeah. And so is the quorum the equivalent of the Homer? Um, yeah, so where was I here? I lost where I was. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's the same, the same as the, the Omer. Okay. 
So 45 gallons or five bushels and five gallons. But in so, this in this situation, would this be the equivalent of 32 pecks in one pipe? I have no idea. Okay. I just don't I don't know all these measurements very well. Um you know, definitely not enough to teach it to anybody. Okay. So I, I got to get these straightened out in my head. And and the paper that I was referring to, I did an email to everyone. So if you search your email, there's a, a paper on the, or uh, what's it called? On the Assyrian, oh, that's not the right one. There's this paper. It's called The Pendulum and the Standards of Measure. So they used a pendulum, and they, which is the basis of the meter. And basically, uh, they can show that these weights and measures are all, all based upon the swinging of a pendulum. Um, so just like we use with the metric system. And they have charts and everything. But I haven't gone through it all, so I, I, I don't understand it enough. I just know it was impressive. Okay, <clears throat> now, am I seeing this correctly? That from the Hebrew, the word that they're translating for the barley is translated in the feminine? Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm just looking at it in Hebrew here. And it was that the battle with the king of the Amorites and he prevailed against them, sons of Ammon. Okay, so um, well, tenth part. Well, weeds in the feminine and It could be just that they it's just that these words occur in the feminine because those things are feminine. I don't Yeah, it's in the feminine, but I'm not sure if that means anything. Okay. Now, all of this is occurring with Jotham, right? Mm-hmm. The, the father of um, uh, Ahaz. And what number of king of Judah was he? Oh.
can't find it here. I thought I'd find it quicker. Uh, here we are. Um, so Jotim was uh, number 11. Okay. Started raining in, in 7.58. Okay. In, in a situation like this, Would we consider Jotham to be the equivalent of uh, W.A. Spicer, the 11th president of the General Conference? Well, who was after him? Watson. Okay. And what, what years would those be? Uh, Spicer was uh, president from 1922 to 1930. And then Watson from? 30 to 36. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I was just trying to apply the 65 years there. Okay. So if you go from 1930 and you go plus 65 years, that brings you to 1995. If you go from the end, it's going to bring you to 2001. But I don't know if that means anything. I don't. I don't know. I've never tried applying all of the different uh, presidents of the Adventist Church to try to line them up in any way with the kings of Judah, other than the end. Uh, I mean, that's an idea, but I don't know. Kind of interesting to me because I'm I'm looking this over very briefly. Um, longest serving general conference president was A. G. Daniels. Yep. And he served roughly for 21 years. Okay. From when to when? 1901 to 1922. Okay. And he was which number of presidents? So he would have been like the ninth or something? He was the 10th. Oh, he was the 10th. So if he served to 22, I, oh, right, because then we had Spicer and then we had, okay. Well, Uzziah is the longest serving uh, king of Judah. No, I guess Manasseh is. He's the second longest. Um, so Uzziah is the 10th. Okay. So I don't know. So you got Uzziah, then you have Jotham's, which would be Spicer. Ahaz would be... Um, this other guy that you mentioned that I can't remember his name now. Watson. Watson. Now, if we go Zedekiah being lined up with Ted Wilson, then Jehoiachin lines up with um, uh, the guy before him. What was his name? Yeah, Paulson. Uh, yeah, Paulson. And then Jehoiakim lines up with Falkenberg? Correct. 
and then Jehoahaz lines up with Neil Wilson. Neil C. Wilson. And then um, Josiah lines up with Robert uh, Pearson. Yeah, Pearson, who was a type of a re reformer. So so maybe there's some virtue in in looking at this um, more thoroughly, seeing if there is this connection between the kings of Though I don't know, you know, with Rehoboam, Rehoboam, whether we could line that up with the first conference president who was, um, what's his name again? Byington. Yeah, Byington. Well, Byington wasn't really a very good conference president, was he? No. No, he, he had some problems that... Uh, yeah. So, so maybe, maybe we can line them up that way. I don't know. It'd be interesting because then there would be elements of three of the kings of Judah that we would line up with James White. Since yes. he served three times. Yeah. And then also we would take the Republican presidents and line them up with the, the kings of Israel, starting with Jeroboam. So Jeroboam would be like Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, there's some work to be done there, I guess, on, on those studies. Okay. Okay, I know that uh, we've divulged or diverted a bit of from our topic, but it's just a, it's a question that comes to mind as, as we're looking at some of these things. Yeah, so, I mean, there's still lots we don't know and lots we haven't sorted out. Weights and measures is one of them. But here we're trying to look at the symbolic nature of 10,000. Right. We can see that it obviously comes in and connects lots of different stories, uh, some of them more directly than others. Um, you know, in some ways, 10,000 is, is an indefinite number. In some some instances, it's just a myriad, just lots, um, like in the way that we use the myriad. That is, we use it sort of as um, I don't know what the word word is for that, but you know, it just kind of it's a huge, uncountable number of something, right? I mean, we right. use that way in English, and and they use it that way in the Bible as well as in specific ways. So, um, so as a symbol, have we really decided so far? We haven't got through all these verses. All we've been able to do so far is present this. We, I don't see that we've come to any kind of conclusion yet. No. Okay. And, and just to go back and remind us of why why we're doing this, that has to do with Judges chapter 4, verse um, uh, uh, 10. Well, well 10, uh, chapter 10, and then 11, or 4, verse 10 and 11, because right. you're dealing with these um, 10,000 men. And a lot of this has to do with the identification then of who Barak is, Heber is, um, and we haven't really even got through the story. No, we haven't. Yeah. So, so, so we're trying to understand if this number ten thousand ties us to our history. And and the thing that we can see is that it does. Right, and we could see that in like the twenty five twelve, for instance. Right. And, and and tying us to Ezekiel 25, 12, which does tie us to our history. So, I mean, and, and there's other ways that we've already tied it as well. So, um, I mean, that was the main reason to look at the 10,000 men. Did it have a symbol? Because it's just one of the symbols in those chapters, in that chapter, in those verses. Yeah, because we've, we've got a lot here to address 
with Barack, with Deborah, with JL, with Heber, and with this 10,000. Mm -hmm. So the next verse, yeah. second and, one. Yeah, and another thing. So remember, uh, Barak called Zebulun. So now you didn't see Odilio's study. No, I didn't. So uh, this goes back uh, to Numbers 2, verse 8. Okay. So, and, and I didn't really agree with how he got there. That is, it did, seemed kind of a tenuous path that he was following. But he found that when he got to the tribe of Zebulun, uh, it, well, and when he got to Numbers 2, verse 8, it mentions this number. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were 57,400. And he had noticed that if we counted back from July 18, 2020, we gave, came to May 23rd, 1863. And that's the end of the general conference where uh, the church organized. So it organized on May 21st, but the first Sabbath and the last day of the conference was on May 23rd. Um, so the fact that we have Zebulun being mentioned here in Judges chapter four, in this context, because he's gonna call of Zebulun and of course of Naphtali as well, to Kadesh, which means the holy place. Somebody had written on a YouTube video that it's a different word, but it, it's just a different form of a word because it's referring to a place rather than to the sanctuary itself. But um, so I think that's kind of interesting. But then you have uh, this numbering of, because we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, so Zebulun, it's 57,400. Naphtali is 53,400. It's uh, 4,000 less. All right. Um, and 4,000 is... Um, well, if we put it in today's, because that's kind of what he was doing, it, it's almost 11 years. And I don't know, if you went back 11 years from 2020, you just come to 2009. So I'm not sure if that has anything to do with do with it. Um, might even just go back from July 18th to 10 years. So that'd be 1873. Maybe there's some significance there. I don't know. But we have we have Zebulun and Naphtali that are tied together here, and Zebulun does connect us from July 18th to the organization of the Adventist Church. That's so. I think there might be something there because we already talked about the first president. Right. Or the presidents of the general conference, and that's when they first organize and they get their first uh, president now according to to what i'm looking at here byington took office on the 20th of march of 1863 so before they had actually organized that's what this is saying yeah because they didn't organize until may 21st they officially became a denomination but what I also find interesting is Byington was born in 1798. Yeah, 1798 till 1887 he lived. Yeah, so in 1887, the year before the rejection of the message of righteousness by faith. So he was born at the time, about the time that the Pope was taken captive at this that we recognize as being the time of the end. But he was laid to rest before the church chose not to accept the third angel's message. 
Yeah, okay. So there's some interesting stuff. So I, I didn't, I wasn't actually listening to what you were saying. So say again what you said. Okay. All right. John Byington was born at the time that we would recognize as being the time of the end when the Pope right. was taken captive. Yeah. But he was laid to rest before the church chose to reject the understanding of the message of the third angel, righteousness by faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it says here, so this is the SDA Encyclopedia Seventh-day Adventist. When the General Conference was formed in May of 1863, John Byington was chosen as, as its first president, when James White declared to serve for personal reasons, or declined to serve, to serve for personal reasons. So it doesn't make sense that he became president in March. Where do you get that? Because I don't see how he could be the president of the General Conference when it doesn't exist yet. I'm looking at list of presidents of General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So it might be a typo. Well, I'm just, all I'm doing is I'm looking at this. This is what's posted currently in Wikipedia. Yeah, okay. That's what I'm saying. It might be a typo. Um, now, when George and Martha Byington Amadon were expelled from Battle Creek Congregation during the purge of 1870, um, says John and Catherine welcomed them into their home in Soresco for several months until their membership was restored. Um, so it's interesting. So now on this on this same topic, currently of the 17 presidents of the General Conference, because James White has served three times. Yeah. 13 of those presidents were born in the United States. One was born in Puerto Rico. One was born in Australia and two were born in Norway. Okay. So it's, I'm intrigued that you know, we're counting the terms of service as having 20 of the presidents of the, of the general conference, when in fact that there's been a total of 17 men that have served. Yeah, so we're counting, um... So we're so we're counting as the American presidents count, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so I'm not really sure. I, I would think. See, I don't know. I'm trying to find out when he became the conference president so it, it would have been during that general conference it wasn't two months before so it can't be march um so i don't know how they you know they say here the 20th of march i think they probably mean the 20th of may because that's the the conference ran from the 20th to the 23rd All right. So um, it says here, Byington was elected on the 21st of May in 1863. And this is on Adventist Heritage, Heritage Ministry. Um, and they mention here, John Byington was born October 8th, 1798, 220 years ago. So they must have put this in here while well, they did this in uh, 98. Yeah, uh, 2018, they, Sorry. they wrote this. Yeah, so 2018. 
And um, so at the first general conference session on May 21st, 1863, John Byington was elected president of the general conference. He served two one-year terms. That's interesting, because that would mean that this this notation with Wikipedia would be off by two months. Yeah. Yeah, and they put March 20th, right? They're just probably marking the beginning of the, the conference. So they elected. Well, it, the big beginning of the conference, as you just said, was May 20th. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So they're taking the number 20 from the idea. So. People make those mistakes. I make those kinds of mistakes all the time. So it's just a typo. Okay. So anyway, this connects us with Odilio's study deal, dealing with Zebulun. The number number of this counts a number of days from 1863 to July 18, 2020 the end of that conference. So from that Sabbath, May 23rd, 1863, it's um, uh, 57,400 days. So five seven four. How does that relate with what we're with what we're studying right now? Um, I don't know. It's um, eighty two weeks. Okay. Um. I don't know. Okay. So as we as we're looking at this, Second Chronicles 30, 24. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and seven thousand sheep. And the princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks and ten thousand sheep. And a great number of priests sanctified themselves. In total, between what the king and the princes have given, you have 2,000 bullocks and you have 17,000 sheep. No matter how you look at that, that's a lot of livestock. Mm -hmm. But why would the princes give more than the king? Because well, there's, there's more of them? More of them, yeah. Okay. Now, Esther 3.9. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have charge of the business and bring it into the king's treasuries. So there's 10,000 talents of silver being offered by Haman for the destruction of the children of Israel. Yeah. So 
why would Haman offer 10,000 talents of silver for the very dubious honor of committing murder? So what's the symbolic meaning of it, you mean? Right. Because he's not really thinking about it. It's just amount of money. Um, well, we don't really know yet what 10,000 means, other than it's this large amount. But it can tie things together. Because this is, of course, dealing with the Sunday law. Definitely. Now we have Psalm 91.7, which comes as the next verse, but it is using the same verbiage that Moses used. And a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Right. So the, again, that would be, uh, of course, the plagues, but this is also dealing with um, uh, a symbol of God's destruction. Okay. Song of Songs. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. Again, using the same verbiage that Moses used. Mm-hmm. Now, the next series of verses are all coming from Ezekiel, specifically Ezekiel 45. Why would this be important for us to understand? Here again, we're dealing with measurement. So if we're dealing with measurement as a symbol, are we dealing with chronology? Yes, we are dealing with chronology. So we look at this, Ezekiel 45.1. Moreover, when ye shall divide the lot, by, when you shall divide by lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord, an holy portion of the land. The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds, and the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. Now, it's, it's been a couple of years since we were going through this with Ezekiel. But what had we determined the reeds, the measurement of the reed was going to be? Well, that's going to be 126 inches. Okay. So we have 10,000 times 126 inches. Yeah. All right. Um, so just, I know we're really scattered here today, but so we looked at, at Adilio's measurement where he took the number to represent a number of days back from July 18th. Now, I just chose arbitrarily, I just chose Dan. Um, and to measure forward, I measured from October 22nd, 1844. And when I do that, I come to June 22nd, 2016. Now, this is part of this structure dealing with uh, Jeff's June 22nd. So this is five years to the day from when the School of the Prophets had um, first, well, well, I guess technically be the first uh, uh, money that was donated or the large sum of money that was donated to start the school of the prophets so that was uh june 22nd 2011 
So Jeff had marked this, and this is five years later. Now, it's in the middle of uh, the time that Stephen and I were in Arkansas. Um, so I don't know specifically what happened on that day, June 22nd. Uh, it's about uh, three and a half weeks before I presented on Ezekiel. So, I mean, I, I'd have to kind of look back and see what we were doing at that time. But it is one year to the day prior to uh, June 22nd, 2017, which is the center of the 777 chiasm. So if we're taking Dan, Dan is a backbiter. Right. right? And of course, he's excluded from the 144,000. And, and so it brings us into this middle of history of 2016, where I'm connected with the School of the Prophets, which had received that donation of uh, whatever it was, $165,000 or something like that, uh, five years earlier. So I think it's kind of interesting. So, I, you know, it's something I need to look into more about these numbers of the children of Israel. And, and I would have to put the whole structure together. That is, I mean, if it's happening for two of them, it should happen for all 12, that they should all represent spans of time. And, and they should be connected to our history. They should be able to connect events in Millerite history to events in our history. Does that seem reasonable? Or events in Adventist history even to our history? So it's just another thing that I have to look into. Okay. Well, while you were while you were beginning to address this, if we have ten thousand reeds at one hundred and twenty six inches, yeah, we wind up with twelve million no one point two six million reeds or inches. Right, and you could then take that as time, and you could um, if you did it as minutes, right? Okay. So it would be uh, 21,000 minutes. I mean, we could have did it as out, done it as hours. So as hours, it would be uh, 52,500 hours. No. No? If you take if you take this in the reads and you divide that by 60 for 60 minutes. Yeah. You get 21,000 minutes, right? Right, 21,000 minutes. You divide that by 60 minutes to an hour, you get 350. Oh, right, 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 right. So 350. So 350 hours. I was looking at it a little differently because when you see 1260, immediately I go to something that, that says to me, this has to be part of the seven times. So I divided it by 2520 and I came up with 500. Okay, so I see. So 500 what? Well, I, like I say, I'm just looking at 2520. I don't know what that would what that would represent. Okay, so it's 2520 um, into 1.26 million. Yeah, 350 hours is a long time. Well, yeah, 350 hours is uh, 14, uh, 14 days. 14.58333. Yeah, so, yeah. So. 14 days and 14 hours. That's interesting. Yeah. So, 
So this portion, we're going to be dealing through this from Ezekiel 45 through Ezekiel 48 with this as being related to chronology. So we're going to be looking at these, these groups of 10,000. We're going to have to look at how all of this is interrelated. When we finish this portion of the Old Testament, we're going to go into this on the New Testament. Now, today's study has been very scattered. I give you that. <laughs> There's a lot for us to consider as to what the importance of this 10,000 symbol is. Now, are you saying that there, there's quite a bit of a symbolic representation from Odilio's study that we should be considering in conjunction with this? Well, at least that point. I mean, uh, some of the stuff I'd already addressed. So in Odilio's study, he had addressed uh, the dark day, um, uh, the earth, Lisbon earthquake, and the falling of the stars. And I had already... Uh, figured some of those things out in connection with our history. That is, I had, here, I'll just show you this here if you stop the share. Okay. Yeah. So, so I didn't put on my chart here what he did with the, uh, the conference president, but I could have put it in there. So here you see he had counted these number of days from November 1st, 1755 to July 18, 2020 which ends up being 264 years, 18 mo eight months, and 17 days. And then from May 19th, 1780, this 87,718 days, and he made uh, reference to the 87 part and the 718 part, this representing July 18th. Um, and then from the falling of the stars, November 13th, 1833, it ends up being um, 186 years and 264 days to July 18th. But I'd already marked that period that the manna fell, the span of time from when the manna first fell to when it last fell, from August 11th, 1980. That's the falling of the stars, the day I was converted. And, and that would be a mirror to the falling of the stars on November 13th. And that's going to be 25, 20 plus one month to September 11th, which ends up being 11,170 days to July 18th. And 1117 is the 187th prime number. And 11 times 17 is 187. And then uh, there's 11, uh, 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 1, 114 days to March 11th. March 11th is the Japan earthquake, and it's part of our lines. That is, I don't show it here, but it's actually connected to um, the June 22nd, uh, 2021 date that I was mentioning, where Jeff received $165,000. That's 311 days to that date. So if you count from the month, you know, 311, when the Japanese earthquake occurred, it brings you to June 22nd, 2011. And that ends up being 113.9 uh, uh, prophetic months to July 18th, 2020. So um, so to put this um, uh, then from Byington, we would put that May 20, uh, 23rd date dealing with the general conference. So I'd have to put that in here as well. So, so there's some, definitely some things that I have to sort out. Okay. We're coming to the close of today's study. There's a lot 
of balls that are now in the air. There's a lot of consideration regarding this with the 10,000 symbol. And we have, we have ranged kind of far afield. As, as we go forward, let's look each one to see what we can contribute for this so that all of the work is not on one or two. Take a look to see what you can find. Find what there is, and let's bring this together again tomorrow. Any other thoughts or questions at this time? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it'd be, I'd be appreciative if anybody's gonna take the time to do some of this. Um, but yeah, so this would be the 57,400 days. Now, all these other things, of course, are dealing with the earthquake, the dark day, the falling of the stars. Um, and then he just, and I can't remember exactly how he does it. I have to go through his notes again, um, but how he comes to to the to Zebulun. And I think it's just interesting that we're dealing with Zebulun in our studies right now. That's the point. Right. And and that brings us back to May 23rd, 1863, the end, the first Sabbath of that general conference, where, you know, the first general conference present, Byington, is is chosen. So I mean there has to be significance in it. We can't just sort of say, uh, you know, it's some kind of coincidence. No. Right. So that's that's kind of my point. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father. In this study today, we, we see our great need of you. There are many elements in this study that we are yet unable to put together. We know, Father, that this will be shown to us in your good time. Direct us today. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. But help us as well so that we may more properly represent your character to all of those with whom we come in contact today. Be with us now. Guide us, we ask, for we need you. Thank you for those that have attended and for those that will attend by video. Be with us now as we, as we depart one from another and bring us again safely tomorrow, if this be your will. For this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Record.